Good morning, everybody. Our subject this morning is the economics of legal tender laws. Uh, the subject is uh, uh, an important element in the causal explanation of our uh, present monetary order, uh, which is characterized, as we have uh, said repeatedly during this week, by two main elements. Most fundamentally, we have a fiat paper money, or more precisely a paper money, because uh, uh, paper money can always only exist as a uh, fiat paper money, that is, as a uh, paper money that is imposed on the market. And paper money could not maintain itself in a competitive market because it lacks uh, intrinsic value, that is, it lacks uh, other uses than the monetary use. So the use of paper money therefore goes in hand with a particular risk that is absent in the case of commodity money, namely the risk of losing all of its purchasing power. If uh, gold or silver would ever fall out of uh, use as monies, as it is presently the case, they are no longer monies, they still exist on the market, they still have prices, because there are many other uses for gold and silver. Silver has a great number of industrial uses. In the <coughs> case of gold, it is similar, uh, aerospace uh, uh, industry and, uh, and others. And, of course, they are also used as jewelry, because... Uh, Human beings have used them for, for many thousand years, so they've become uh, used to them, the good old friends, and they're actually very beautiful metals. So they always have uh, some prices, and built on these prices, they can be used again as media of exchange, right? That's what uh, we learn through the regression, the uh, regression theorem, that money arises uh, based on um, the subjective value of market participants who evaluate its, uh, its use, its usefulness, namely its, uh, its purchasing power, uh, based on these uh, past prices. In the case of paper money, uh, such prices would not exist if paper money were no longer money. Uh, so if, uh, for one reason or the other, it f uh, falls out of use, well, it would, could not re-emerge spontaneously on the market. So there's a particular risk associated with its use. So paper money is always a fiat money. It's always imposed on the market. And uh, uh, the other characteristic institution of our present monetary order is central banking. And central banking, as you have learned during this week, arises essentially as a response to the problems of fractional reserve banking. Uh, fractional reserve banks are uh, inherently bankrupt, or we might say more uh, politely, more wishy-washy, that they have uh, uh, greater liquidity problems than other banks. And these liquidity problems periodically uh, manifest themselves whenever too many customers demand the redemption of fractional uh, reserve uh, banknotes and fractional reserve checks and want to have back their deposits. In that case, then the bank, if there are too many customers who show up, the bank goes bankrupt. And to confront this, well, banks uh, have an incentive to pool their reserves. So uh, central banking arises spontaneously uh, on a market that is plagued with uh, fractional reserve banking as a response to fractional reserve banking. And we can represent fractional reserve banking with an inverted pyramid. Uh, this uh, up here representing uh, the, the issues, so let's say 100 unit, 100 million dollars, and at the base, we have some base money, which we can represent with a, the symbol of a coin. So here we would have a 10% reserve, reserve ratio. We have 10 uh, units of reserves and 100 units of issues. Whenever the demand for redemption is higher than 10 units, the bank cannot comply. It goes bankrupt. And this, of course, then entails the bankruptcy of the entire bank fractional reserve banking system, because if one bank goes bankrupt, then this year its issues, which are part of the money supply, loses all its value, so this disappears as a consequence, as a pressure on the price level, as a consequence, there will be payment difficulties for all market participants, the incomes of all market participants, whether they be customers of this bank in particular or customers of other banks, the mo their monetary incomes will tend to shrink. And as a consequence, these other banks will have difficulties replenishing their reserves. Okay. 
It's a European one, right? So it looks like a seven. Okay, right? So the bankruptcy of one bank entails payment difficulties for the other bank. So the liquidity problem, uh, the virtual liquidity problem becomes an actual liquidity problem. These other banks go bankrupt too. So what they can do is to um, cooperate, thereby establish a virtual pooling of their reserves, right? By cooperating, you establish a virtual pool, let's say, of 30 units of money. So this here is no longer, strictly speaking, individual. Right? Cooperation means that if one of my sister organization goes, is in, 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 in trouble, I will help them out. So, as a matter of fact, now through cooperation between banks, there exists a common pool of 30 units of money. That is, each single bank is now able to confront a, uh, to confront re redemption demands of more than 30 units, uh, thir more than 10 units, which before would have entailed its bankruptcy. So, if the customers of this bank demand 15 units for redemption, it can now comply because it can rely on the on the reserves of the other banks. Right? So we have a virtual common pool that is being created. And then, of course, there are difficult there are, uh, costs uh, associated with the management of this pool, especially if you not only have three banks, as in my stylized example here, but if you have many, many banks, uh, and you have uh, you know, problems of enforcing the rules because, of course, this uh, entails moral hazard for each of them. Right? Now, each single bank has an incentive to increase its issues because it can rely on the, uh, on the larger virtual pool. So each single one of them has an incentive to increase its issues, let's say, to 200 or 300 units. Right. So we see that cooperation in the banking industry has a completely different significance from what the public usually believes. The public believes that Cooperation is a good thing. You, know, you always imagine people holding hands and walking through the fields and uh, helping one another out, sharing meals and sharing songs and so on. And that's, that's very nice and good, but in, in the case of the banking industry, cooperation is born out of the fact that uh, all of them are inherently bankrupt. So you have a, uh, a, a bunch of uh, uh, handicapped, so to say, but while well, handicapped is, is a, it's not a uh, correct, uh, pe people who are crooks and they're getting together in order to help them uh, uh, one another out. And uh, this cooperation actually um, increases the, the initial problem, right? So as the Marx Marxists would say, you reproduce the same problem that we had before, namely virtual illiquidity of the banks, only at a higher level. Right? Because we still have the same amount of base money in the economy, we still have 30 units, but now the, the total issues are no longer 300, it would be 600 in my example. And things are essentially the same if uh, this virtual corporation is institutionalized, if for example um, the compensation scheme uh, between the, the payments compensation scheme between the banks uh, is institutionalized and then turned into a central bank, and this central bank then issues its own currency, which often happens. So we have here the 30 units, which are now the, the base money at the, the bottom of this uh, central bank. And the central bank issues its own money, let's say, for example, 100 units. And these 100 units, they are now equally divided between the, uh, the banks. Some of this might be in circulation, but each of the banks might now get, oh, excuse me, 20 units of central bank money, right. and on the basis of this, they would make their own issues, and what the central what the bank now can do is to increase its own issues, let's say from um, 100 to 300, triples the amount of uh, central bank money, and as a consequence, uh, the reserves of the commercial banks would also be tripled, and you can triple, therefore, also the issues. Right? So central banking is an essential element in uh, monetary expansion, expansionism, 
and uh, and inflation. Now, how does the this institution come about? How do we get to the point of uh, establishing fractional reserve banking and uh, central banking? Uh, how did we how did we get there? And one uh, important element to explain this is um, the theory of legal tender laws, the subject that we have to deal with today. It explains us that whatever the um, imaginary or real benefits of such a system are, of course, Austrians believe that it has no aggregate benefits. It's by and large a, a scheme to enrich some market participants at the expense of everybody else. But what, even if it has some uh, aggregate advantages, the main reason why it comes into existence is um, that legal tender laws have created a dynamic, have set the rules of uh, currency competition, of, cur of money production in such a way that there is a tendency toward the spontaneous development of such a system. And this is what I propose to explain to you this morning. So we'll start off with the definition of legal tender. Legal tender is a legal obligation for the market participants to accept a particular type of money, even if they have made contracts that stipulate the payment in another type of money. Okay, let's take an example. You have, again, Peter and Paul. And Paul is the owner of a nice chair, an Italian chair. And Peter is the owner of money, right? So he has whatever. Uh, 30 ounces of silver. And Paul has this nice chair. So they make a contract. They exchange these two objects. And now what the legal tender law could say is that um, you have to accept in payment uh, paper notes, for example, of a certain type, or let's say we are, it also works with uh, other commodity monies, let's say gold, uh, gold of a certain type, for example, um, might stipulate that all payments have to be made in gold, even if the payment has been contractually agreed to be a different type of money. So here the payment has to be agreed to be in, in silver, and the legal tender law sh uh, could say, well, rather than silver, you have got to be uh, you also have to accept a payment in gold. So Peter then could pay Paul in terms of gold, even though Paul had wished to be paid in silver. And so it overrules, the legal tender law, law overrules um, contracts, and it is in that respect um, already on a moral point, from a moral point of view, much more pernicious than um, a monopoly law, for example. If you have a monopoly for a certain type of money, then people are at least free to evaluate this type of money as they see fit. What a legal tender law does is to overrule the choice that you make, that the evaluations of, of economic goods that you make, and tell you what this good is equal to uh, on the market. A legal tender law in practice requires that you define uh, an exchange rate at which the, the legal tender, that is the legally privileged type of money, has to be accepted um, uh, at the place of, of other goods. For example, if the government wants gold to be the money that is being used, then it has to define how much gold is, how, uh, is worth how much of silver legally. Right? This is a technical requirement, otherwise you, you cannot uh, operationalize the system. So, if, for example, you could say uh, one ounce of gold is equal to whatever, 10 ounces of <coughs> silver. So, in this case, then Peter would have the right, he could, of course, also pay um, Paul uh, in terms of silver, but he could pay him, rather than with uh, 30 ounces of silver, he could pay him with 10 ounces of gold. Okay, so far so good. You might say, okay, so what's the big deal? What's the further complication? Paul could be a, a Peter could be a, 
uh, nasty guy and just force the, the poor, uh, poor Paul to exchange, take this gold and exchange it back again into silver. So, so what's the big deal? So things get interesting as soon as the legally defined exchange ratio between gold and silver is not the same one uh, as the market rate. So as long as this legally ex uh, legal exchange rate coincides with the market rate, it is really just what the law does is just to create more complications for for Paul. Right? Paul has to take this gold and then exchange it back. He would lose somewhat like an exchange fee or whatever, but by and large, that would be it. Right? Just an increase of aggregate costs. Would, the economy would get somewhat more inefficient. Things get interesting. Uh, so if this legal exchange rate is different from the market rate, let's suppose the market, so this is the legal rate. What's the market rate? Uh, let's say the market rate is uh, 1 to 20. In this case, um, Peter would have no incentive to use gold, to make use of this uh, uh, legal tender law, and rather than pay 30 ounces of silver, pay, uh, uh, according to the law, 3 ounces of gold. Because the 3 ounces of gold on the market, they would be worth 60 ounces of silver. Uh, so, in this case, clearly he would prefer rather to, to pay the 30 ounces of silver as uh, provided in the contract rather than claim his legal right to also pay in gold. So, this is the first alternative. Right? And then we have the second alternative, and here things get interesting. If namely one ounce of gold is equal, let's say, to five ounces of silver. If this is the case, then clearly Peter has an incentive not to pay in silver, but to make use of the law and say, well, I pay you legally in gold. Uh, because he would pay uh, three ounces of gold according to the law, but these three ounces of gold are only worth 15 ounces of silver. Uh, so he would, in fact, rob his uh, partner. Right? He would rob Paul. Now, in this case, uh, um, we have, uh, therefore, uh, one type of money that is legally overvalued as compared to the, the market. This type of money, in our case here, would be gold. Right? Gold is the overvalued money. It's the bad money. And silver is the good money. It's the undervalued market. There's the legally undervalued market, undervalued as compared to its price that it would have on the market. Okay. Now, the consequence of this case here, which is the most uh, interesting one and also the most relevant one in practice, the implication of this is that henceforth, because people know that this will happen, all the Pauls in the world, they know that if they conclude a contract in terms of silver, well, they, 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 they risk being paid in gold anyway and being robbed. So what do they do? Henceforth, they no longer make any contracts in silver that provide for a silver payment, but only uh, for a gold pay payment. So the, the perverse consequence, therefore, is that in the, if gold is legally overvalued, that no more contract will be made in terms of silver. The bad money, therefore, occupies all the exchanges. All exchanges will henceforth be, be made in gold. And the good money, namely silver, will disappear from the market. Okay. And this is called in, uh, in economics, this is Gresham's Law. Gresham's Law says, bad money drives good money out of the market under a regime of price controls. And the Last stipulation is crucial. Right? It's not the case that bad money drives out good drives good money out of the market in general. Right? It's not a general law of, of currency competition. 
Uh, it is a law of monetary interventionism. If the government steps in and fixes a legal exchange rate different from the market exchange rate, then the overvalued money will drive the undervalued money out of the market. Now, that is relevant because, of course, there is a reason why people provide or have a wish to uh, provide for a payment in silver rather than gold. People uh, prefer silver for gold for whatever reason, right? For, for example, uh, silver mine uh, production output is relatively modest, whereas gold mine production uh, tends to increase. Therefore, there is uh, uh, the risk that the purchasing power of gold will erode or something, right? Or silver might be more practical for daily exchanges, so people want to have a payment in silver rather than in gold or something. And uh, so what the law then therefore boils down to is to substitute for uh, a money that the people would not have chosen spontaneously uh, for a money that they would like to use. Right? It's really the bad money from in, bad in light of the subjective value judgments of the, of the market participant. The bad money drives the good money right, out of the market in a regime of price controls. Uh, Gresham, Gresham, so it's called Gresham's Law, after Sir Thomas Gresham, who was the uh, agent of the British government at, at the time of the, of the British crown, uh, on the largest uh, financial market of its time, so, uh, late 16th century, does anybody know where this largest financial market of the time was? What? It was not Amsterdam. Amsterdam came into full swing in the 17th century. Okay, so here we're talking about the late 16th century. So Gresham was the agent of Queen Elizabeth I. Well, he was writing regular reports, and in one of these reports he described this phenomenon, right, that the, the perverse consequence of such legally defined exchange rates was to uh, bring about what we just described, drive the bad money out of the market. Uh, no, the city was uh, Antwerp, okay, what is today is Belgium. That's the city of Antwerp. Uh, Gresham was not the first to, uh, to describe this, um, but at the time when this law in question was called Gresham's Law, the economists had forgotten of the, the first discoverers. It was known in antiquity, right? We find a, a fairly accurate description of this in in a poem, actually, by the Greek uh, poet Aristophanes. And we find uh, an accurate description also in um, a work by Nicholas Oresme, who was a great uh, uh, 14th century uh, uh, theologian, who uh, was also the author of the first treatise on money, uh, Nicholas Oresme. So it's called Gresham's Law, but there were previous discoverers. Now, let's see how uh, Gresham's Law um, operates under different monetary regimes. And what we uh, want to explain in particular, what, uh, or what we want to see in particular, are the differences of, it, of the consequences that it has in a commodity money system as compared to a fractional reserve system and a paper money system. Okay, so that's what we are mainly interested in. And the reason, of course, why... Uh, the, the legal tender tends to be overvalued on the market is that it provides a cheap way out of uh, uh, for governments to pay their debts. Right? So that was historically the reason why governments have overvalued a certain type of money uh, because it allowed them to to pay back their debts. Right? For example, this this Peter uh, you substitute whatever. Uh, uh, you take here, Paul is a, a citizen, and he has, uh, he has lent uh, 25 ounces to his government. And Peter is the government, he's the king or the prince or whatever, and he's, so he's supposed to pay back 30 ounces of, of silver one year later or three years later or whatever. And now Peter so happens to be also the guy who defines the law, and <laughs> He said, well, yeah, out of concern for the public welfare and so on, I hereby declare that gold henceforth, one ounce of gold, is henceforth worth five ounces of silver, and that you have to accept gold for all payments. And now, my dear friend Paul, I'll pay you back. 
That's how they did it. So let's see then how this uh, operates in a commodity money system. And a commodity money system, uh, we, of course we were talking about real commodity uh, money systems in which therefore there's some form of government interventionism. And government interventionism takes place in the form of depreciation, of depreciation of the coinage. Oh, this was the image of the king, and so this this, this is the value uh, of this of this coin. Uh, the image of the king is not uh, as some uh, people still hold was uh, the the reason why the, the the image or the portrait of the king was in later times, actually not in former times, was uh, stamped on the coin was not born out of the urge of the king to communicate with the subjects because they didn't seem often enough or, or something but to um, uh, uh, represent the certification authority, because what a coin is, is in fact a certified amount of money. So for here it might be, whatever, 10 grams of gold or 10 grams of silver, and because nobody could read in those days, except for a few monks, uh, you had to use some, some symbol that represented the certification authority. So here it is your dear friend, uh, the ruler. Right, the prince. He certifies there are ten units of money in this coin, ten weight units in this coin. Now, what he does is, uh, uh, because uh, that, that was the way you you inflated the money supply in, at the time. What he uh, does here is, uh, he can do either one of two things. He can either stamp a higher amount of money on the coin, but well, still his nice image. You know, the grin has grown bigger. And uh, it's now 20 units, right? And so this, even though the, the metallic content is still the same, there's still 10 units of metal in the coin, but now you have to accept this as though it contained 20. Okay, so that's, of course, inflation. Right? It's an increase of the nominal amount of money right? uh, beyond the real amount. But uh, this happened very rarely, right? because uh, people would have been uh, revolted. So what they did usually uh, was uh, to keep the outer appearance of the coin. <coughs> Looks exactly as, the same as before, but it doesn't contain the same thing. They take some metal out. Okay, It no longer contains, it's no longer a full-bodied coin, no longer full uh, 10 units of uh, metal in it, but only 5, let's say, or something. Either that would be dramatic. Right? It would not be five, uh, 10, but whatever, 8.5 or something. Right. And the, so the metal that can be that was taken out of this uh, out of each coin can then be used to produce additional coins that can then be used for, by the government to make additional expenditure. Right. The diluting of the purchasing power of money that eventually then showed up in uh, higher prices and so on. So that was depreciation. Um, what the legal law legal tender law then does is to say that everybody is legally obliged to use these new coins on the same footing with the old coins. Right? Now, uh, this explains much of the conservatism of former times. Right? All new things somehow seem to be bad. Right? And people were using the good old coins. Right? And uh, uh, in monetary, uh, in monetary historians have a very imperfect uh, grasp of the extent of the depreciation that took place because uh, what we know about ancient coins mainly relates to the good coins. Because all the ancient coins that we know, we know them through um, uh, uh, treasures that were dug into the ground. Okay. Now what kind of coins were, did the people take and dug into deep holes in their garden or in the, in the back office and so on? Well, only the good coins. Right? Because Gresham's law he entailed the same consequence as before. Nobody made any more consequent, uh, any more contracts in terms of the, the old coins. Nobody paid out the old coins any uh, old uh, coins anymore. But everybody used the the new coins. Okay, everybody used the new coins for the same reason as in our previous example. So the new coins were driving the old coins out of the market, 
And the, gold, uh, the old coins were therefore either um, uh, hoarded and dug into the ground because they had to be hidden from the government. Uh, so and therefore we find them today, a few hundred or a few thousand years later. Uh, or they were sold abroad, right, exported to some territory where the law does not apply. Uh, neighboring country where they don't have such silly laws and so on, so the coins are the coins are exported and melted down and turned into the local coin. So that's the reason why the only what well, well, essentially what we know about coinage, ancient coinage, concerns good coins which were dug into the ground. Okay, as, a, as an aside. Okay, so there is this tendency for yeah, again for the bad coins to drive out the good coins, but it is clear, of course, that. Uh, for a technological reason, this must entail a more or less uh, protracted uh, uh, reduction of the total money supply for the following reason. This de- depreciation takes time. Right? It is, for technical reasons, impossible to change the entire coinage of the country from one day to another. Certainly in those days, right? you had a couple of mints that were operating, even if you operated them uh, 24 hours, 7 days, which was not possible, uh, because Sunday was the Lord's Day, uh, then you, you still, yeah, you, you, you couldn't change the coinage sufficiently fast. So there was an intermediate time during which uh, the old coins were hoarded, were taken out of circulation, and people were not yet fully equipped in terms of new coins. Uh, so the overall quantity of money, the overall money supply, shrank uh, so you uh, created uh, deflationary impact, which of course were, was uh, unwelcome even from the government's point of view, okay? because it reduced uh, tax revenue, it also reduced rent revenues. In those days, governments were essentially big uh, noble uh, landowners, so they had a lower monetary income and so on. Right? Uh, so depreciation was the inflation technique of the old world, right, the antiquity, and up to the 17th century. Uh, and it consisted in an artificial increase of the nominal amount of money, but this artificial increase entailed negative consequences, uh, even from the point of view of the government itself, right? especially through its de- deflationary impact on the uh, money supply. Another negative impact was that uh, uh, foreign uh, merchants henceforth try to avoid the country, right? If, if you have a territory that is plagued by uh, de- uh, depreciation and you risk being paid in, in terms of, uh, uh, of coins uh, that are uh, not as valuable as they would need to be f- for your um, investment to be worthwhile, well, then I mean, there's no point for, for you to, to go to this territory and sell there. So international trade uh, is lower, therefore, for this reason, too, the division of labor is lower, so the productivity is lower, economic growth is hampered. Right? So depreciation entails a lot of negative consequences. Uh, and another um, uh, disadvantage of uh, depreciation is that coinage could not be competitive. Of course, it's not the case that uh, the princes of the time were particularly eager to have uh, competitive coinage, um, but anyway, that was the case. It was not possible to have this kind of system on a competitive basis. You cannot depreciate competitively. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, depreciation, uh, coinage was, uh, in virtually all cases, was a monopoly. Right? Only one mint had the right, or maybe the, the prince's mint or the king's mint, had the right to produce uh, coins. There were uh, two or three major cases in which, uh, which were an exception, in which several mints had the right to produce the same type of coin for the same territory. And of course, what happens then is that uh, depreciation leads to uh, the ruin of the coinage. Let's say you have three mints that can produce exactly the same coin. So they look exactly like one another. And all of these have legal uh, tender, tender status. Then... For each of the, these minters, there exists an incentive to de, de, uh, depreciate its coins as fast as possible. Let's say um, uh, 
Uh, this coin has a 50% content, this coin would have a 100% content, and this coin would have a 10% content. 50% uh, content, if, if all three men start off with, a, with the same amount of uh, base money, that is of, of gold or of silver, it means that this mint here can produce uh, two, type, two times as many coins as this coin, as, as this mint. Okay, so it's flooding the market, and the market participants are legally obliged to accept its coins in payment. Right? So there is a, is a guaranteed market for this. Legal tender laws create a guaranteed market. And of course, this guy, he can create ten times as many coins as the others. Right? And of course, these others understand this. So this guy, unless he's very foolish, uh, he will very, start, very soon will also start to reduce the metallic content of its, of its coin. So every one of them has an incentive, in fact, to produce churn-out coins that have no metallic content, whatever, <laughs> a, a precious metal in them, but are merely nominal coins. And that's exactly what happened, right, in those cases in which we did it. One case was, for example, in, uh, in, uh, in the area uh, today known as, as Austria, in uh, the 15th century, 1460-62, uh, um, when the uh, local prince was in dire financial straits. I know this is a great surprise for you. It's a very <laughs> exceptional uh, situation for, for a government. And uh, so in order to get out of this, the prince sold the right of coinage, sold minting rights to lesser noblemen around him. So he sold one such uh, privilege to the uh, bishop of Salzburg and uh, was also a prince, was also a secular prince and uh, two or three other minting rights to, to other no, uh, lesser princes. And they started immediately churning out the pfennig, so the, the penny, which was a silver coin at the time. And very soon, this, uh, the former silver coin was no longer, no, no, no longer a trace of silver in it. Right? It was a pure uh, copper coin. Right? So, and of course, a big in, uh, deflation, uh, inflation and so on. So, uh, uh, to sum up, depreciation, from a technical point of view, requires that money production be monopolistic. You cannot perform it on a competitive base. And that, of course, means uh, low incentives for the producers to bring in a techni uh, te uh, pursue technological in innovations and so on, improve the kind of coins that they produce, and so on. Right? So we get, by and large, a lousy currency that is more and more depreciated. Now, let's look at how the same thing works out, how legal tender laws work out in the case of fractional reserve banks. So we have our fractional reserve bank. That operates on this basis, as we have seen before. And uh, how does inflation work in this case? Well, what the bank does is, is to create additional notes, uh, or it creates additional, uh, additional volume on demand deposits. Right? So it moves up from, let's say, 100 to 200 units of total issues. Right? And these, uh, this total volume is also in... In smaller units, so ten ten dollar notes or whatever. Now the point is, if you if the bank now produces an additional ten dollar note, then this new note is, from a physical point of view, not different from the old note. It's physically indistinguishable. So the problem that we have here in the case of depreciation, namely that you create two types of physically different uh, money. This problem no longer exists. The, the new money uh, is physically exactly the same as the old money. Uh, the overall quality of the money diminishes because uh, the reserves have been lowered. Right? You know, the reserves decrease from 10% to, to, to 5%. Right? But um, individual, the individual objects are not different from one another. Now this means that Gresham's law does not kick in. It's not the case that the new nodes drive out the old nodes. It would make no sense. So the new nodes circulate side by side with the old nodes 
on the market. And there's no hoarding of the old notes and no exporting of the old notes. So the money supply does not shrink. There is not this deflationary tendency that we have noted in the case of depreciation. So fractional reserve banking therefore avoids the problems that depreciation brings about even from the point of view of the of the prince, of, of the government. Right? Depreciation is negative from an overall point of view. It, it does not increase the welfare of the, of the population. It reduces growth rates and so on, as we have seen. But at least it benefits the prince right, at the expense of, uh, of his subjects. But even from the point of view of the prince, there are various negative consequences. In the case of fractional reserve banking, it's again negative from the aggregate point of view. It's positive from the prince, but no longer negative from the point of view of the prince. Right? The negative consequences that we had here disappear. Right? No more deflation, no more uh, incentive for foreign merchants to avoid the country. Right? So the show goes on as long as the bank is able to pay, right? as long as it's not in a bank run. Right? That's the only limit to this, uh, to this process. Now we see here very clearly that this is the incentive to switch monetary order. So the reason why gold uh, coins and silver coins, the traditional monies of the ages, have been uh, abandoned, have been replaced in a process spread out uh, through time uh, from the 17th century onward by uh, tickets, uh, banknotes created by banks, is not the superiority of, of bank money as compared to metallic money, right, from an aggregate point of view, it is that this new bank money has less uh, negative consequences for the government itself. 